All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, welcome to this um, panel um, on, uh, hopefully, it's going to be an exciting panel on e-governance and e-participation, right? Um, I will introduce you to our panelists in a bit. And before I introduce myself, my name is Marcus Nito. Um, I'm a director for innovations and uh, partnerships at uh, the United Nations Development Program. And um, I want to first thank you, uh, Telefonica, which is our host, and also to say that this panel is being taken as part of the Social Good Summit and the Plus Social Good Platform. Those uh, platforms are a partnership between the United Nations Development Program, Mashable, the United Nations F uh, Foundation, Ericsson, uh, 92Y in, in New York. And the Social Good Summit it's an opportunity where we bring together in over 50 countries with two big hubs um, in Nairobi and in New York between activists, CEOs, youth, celebrities to discuss the way technology can generate a better world. And this year is going to take place at between September 22nd and 24th, right? So uh, hopefully you can, uh, as live stream, so you can be part of it. So technology, um, it's transforming our lives. You know this. You've heard it previous panel. Um, but let me give you, from the United Nations point of view, a little bit of uh, data and statistics, right? We believe that there is 6.2 billion mobile subscribers around the world. Most, you know, 85% of those are in developing countries. So what you have here is the, I, the first time in history that a piece of technology, the mobile technology, expands so fast to so many people in so many countries. So the question is, what does it matter from the point of view of participation, from people's participation and its relationship with governments? It, it matters a lot. We actually believe that, you know, and we're starting to see that mobile technology has really empowered citizens and empowered individuals to start having a voice in governments. And in the public, in the, poli the political life in the countries that didn't exist before. You have examples in the last few years with the Arab Spring, the M15 movement in Spain, the Occupy movement in, in the United States, and recently this year, the protests in Brazil and in Turkey, right? We actually think that we are at the verge of a paradigm shift towards a democratization, you know, of countries, but more important, in some countries, a deepening of the democratic process by the use of mobile technologies. Governors don't necessarily know yet how to handle of this. They're trying. They're, they're trying their best to give an idea. Most governors in the world, in some way, some ways or another, have embr embraced the notion of e-government um, and e-governance. You know, between uh, 2010 and 2012, um, the number of citizens that are participating in governance process via technology has grown 73%, right, in the space of the last two years. So that's an, uh, also the government's trying to figure out how to go about this. So you have, we at the United Nations Development Program, as the development agency of the United Nations system, have been working on issues of e-governance in 90 countries, and last year alone we supported 220 information communication technology programs around 90 countries. You know, we have been involved on uh, those issues as UNDP um, since the first real conference in 1992, right? And let me give you a couple of examples of what, we, what have we been doing before I introduce you to the panelists and let them share with you they experience is we have uh, one of the poster child of this revolution is crowdsourcing, right? Anyone nowadays, um, governments, companies, individuals have the potential to reach out to the voice of the people, right? So we at the United Nations, to the UNDP, together with other UN agencies, have crowdsourced to some degree 
the world's opinion about what should replace the Millennium Development Goals, right? So, as you know, the, the international community governments agree on a series of goals which come to expire at the end of 2015. So, the, the member states of the United Nations are going to come together starting next year to figure out what is going to be the next goals of the international community and poverty, better health, whatever those will be. Um, but different than last time, 15 years ago, we have put a process in place that we want the global population to tell what are their priorities so we can provide that to government as an input. So we've crowdsourced. There's a platform, the world we want to live in, the world we want. There is, and I actually recommend and encourage everybody to put up their mobiles and vote while I'm talking on your priorities. Go to myworld.org and vote, promote, tweet, do whatever we're supposed to do to, to have your voices heard into this global process. Let me also give you a few examples of what we're doing in the countries, right? So we've been working with a civil society organization in India on a platform called um, I Paid a Bribe. And it's basically a platform that tries to, by sending SMSs to, you know, uh, to government officials in around the, the Indian, that has mapped up the pattern and the type of you know, corruption that happens. And this has generated a whole campaign in India for the Indian government to actually sign up to the United Nations Convention on Anti-Corruption, which they did in 2011. So mobile, monitoring corruption, changing national policy. A second one is in Kenya. In 2007, after the elections in Kenya, there were a lot of uh, uh, political upheaval in the country. So in preparation for the 2010 election and the 2013 election, um, UNDP has worked in creating a platform in which people that were trained could SMS the places where possible um, conflict were going to start happening. And then trained mediators were sent to those parts of Kenya or Nairobi and you know, cities where trouble were brewing prior to trouble ar uh, arrived. You know, so it was one way to, to do conflict prevention in elections all through um, technology. So I, I don't want to carry on because we have a fantastic panel to you guys. Let me introduce you who's going to talk. And we might have a, a fifth panelist which is stuck in traffic or somewhere in London. <laughs> Um, which is Kevin Watson from the Overseas Development Institute. So if he walk by, you will know who he is. Um, uh, but let me start by saying that um, we have a great people here with us, starting here with uh, Philip Tigo, right, who is a activist, has flown from Nairobi today to be with us. And um, Philip is uh, part of a team at Ethernet that works on developing mobile and web-based technologies aimed at strengthening the role of citizens and civil society to meaningfully, meaningfully engage with the state through strategic use of technology. Uh, beside Philip, we have um, you know, Jeff Martin, who is the founder of uh, Tribal Bands and Tribal Technologies. In previous life, Jeff spent uh, 10 years at uh, Apple, uh, working very close with uh, the late Steve Jobs. And for six of those 10 years, uh, he was the head of music, entertainment, and marketing, and played a pivotal role in Apple's transition from authorizing tools standardized by the entertainment industry to a consumer platform for the consumption of entertainment and user-generated content. And right there at the end, we have um, Alberto, which was in the previous panel. Alberto it, um, you know, works with Telefonica, and he's an associate professor at um, IE, Business School, member of the Spanish CSR Council, the Global Compact Spanish Steering Committee, the stakeholders of Council of Global Report Initiatives, and a Council of the Chair of Business Ethics at the University Pontificia de Comillas in Spain. So without further ado, let's listen what they have it, and then we're going to open up to questions from you and an interaction. We should be all wrapped up in about an hour here. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Marcos. Uh, Good evening. Yeah. Good evening. <laughs> I'm trying to connect with you guys. Um, as you've heard, I'm from Nairobi, um, Kenya. I think before 2007, all we were known for is athletics, 
and the Maasai Mara. <laughs> He's the wildebeest, uh, some tourism much there. But I think um, what we've been asking ourselves, and many of us who are uh, who've been struggling around technology and development have been asking ourselves, what changed in 2007? Especially in Kenya and in most cases, along what is being known as Silicon Savannah. Um, and a lot of us have been asking ourselves uh, in, in that case. So we know that um, African countries have been very vibrant around other issues. We know Africa has always been known for the vices around governance, which is corruption, lack of human rights, issues of constitutionalism and rule of law. So you have all these vices that have been there. Then you've had a vibrant civil society, which is a very much organized way of, of engaging the state, even while the state was unresponsive. But then I think for us in 2007, what we started seeing was an emergence of a third force. And the third force was, was simply another group of young people who, who these two spaces have not been able to capture their imagination, neither civil society and neither the state. But you had this new group of young people, as Marcos has mentioned, is really young, very energetic, very educated, highly motivated, and very informed. I always tell, uh, it's quite interesting that today is actually the 15th anniversary of Google. Precisely, exactly today. So you can imagine how within 15 years, how, how young people access or, 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 or search for information has changed. So previously, like in continent like ours, information was centralized. With technology and the advent of how people are accessing it in very different and unique ways, and information was, uh, was quite liberalized. And therefore, you have this new emerging young person with a very different kind of form of power. And as much as we're talking about technology and innovation, I think the, the, the reality is that, especially in countries like ours, that people are now self-organizing. And, and, and that, I think, is, a new, is something new that we are seeing. And the self-organization is coming from a realization that power has shifted. And perhaps that shift of power is from central to very decentralized, from institutions to very much individual. And the individual organizing, the individual communicating in near real time every time. I'm um, sure people here are tweeting, people are Facebooking, people are texting. You, 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 people communicate in multiple channels. You may not necessarily be talking to, to each other. You're talking to a space where, or a newfound space. And that for us, I think we're finding it a bit, a bit interesting, and especially when, when technology is spreading in very interesting ways. People, say, people talk about uh, poverty in Africa. People like us try to discount that a lot, because poverty for us, we don't think is a barrier to accessing technology, uh, in a way, because um, what we're seeing is increasing that, that even the poor may want or choose to miss meals over owning a cell phone or two cell phones. Uh, if you look at c countries like Ghana, they have over 105% penetration of mobile phone. I think in, in, in mathematical sense, that seems a bit absurd, but that's a fact. And Ghana is, is, is one of the poorest countries uh, in the world. Um, I think in terms of uh, d dynamics of power also, uh, especially I in the space of democracy, the whole idea of contestation that we're seeing with young people having tools and mobile phones and technology with, uh, with government trying to understand how young people are using or how people are accessing technology, we are seeing the new space of, of contestation is expression. So it's, it's not your tradition um, uh, matches on the street. It's not your traditional placards or, or people walking on the street, which is a very powerful form of protest, of course. But it's more uh, um, uh, um, 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 a more robust kind of very sophisticated way of engaging that's in cyberspace, and that is in pseudonyms, is in, is in handles, is in, is in hashtags, is, is in very d dynamic forces. Um, and that's why I come, I think, to my third space. Um, when we talk about democracy, or e-democracy, or m-democracy, or, or, or whatever you're calling it, or iPads, or, or, or phablets, or, or whatever you're talking about, I think we are looking at beyond a paradigm shift. We're looking at a new political imaginary. And I think for us, and, and many of us who understand how activism works, is that we are from an institution. When I close m my desk at five, everything is shut down. I have an email account, it's an, it's an institutional email account. Once I leave at five o'clock, that is shut down. But what we're seeing now, I think, is a, is a convergence between the personal and the political. Many people are, hash, are tweeting from their personal handles. They can't differentiate from the institutional handles. You see something, you tweet, you watch, you, you, you engage your usual very middle class uh, group in very different ways. Um, um, then I, th I think, and, and, and as Marcos has mentioned, because of these increasing pathways, because of these increasing channels, 
democracy is being deepened in many ways. People are beginning to understand what previously was very much in the very technocratic kind of language of technical fixes and all that. Um, and, and so I think in summary, I look at it, I think, in, in, in this way. If we look at people, if we look at it in the context of people, power, and spaces, because that's how we look at it. If you look at people, it's a young group, very informed, very energetic, very intransient, because even the youth now is, is, is not even in terms of youth, in terms of age. It's also in terms of youth, in terms of ideas, how people engage it. If you look at power, I think power has shifted. Power is no longer in the hands of central government. Government is trying to understand how things work. A country like mine, M-Pesa, which is our formidable mobile money transfer, came way before legislation. So I think it's about even how technology is beginning to shape even how um, policies are being made. Uh, it's about, I think, spaces. And, and, and the spaces we're seeing now are these very creative, energetic, interesting, uh, whether it's on mobile, whether it's on, on web, or, or whether it's on any other new emerging space. I think we are seeing for the first time that the voices that were in the margins the voices like us, who people knew were only uh, runners or footballers uh, or that, are beginning to be seen in a very different way. So the margins are beginning to come at the center, which was not what was really uh, previously most visible. The margins are running a new narrative. If you Google today, I think it would be quite interesting to see how the dominant narrative or what was pro previously official speak being at the margins. If you Google about Kenya, it's quite interesting. What you'll see is MPs greed. What you'll see is, is members of parliament wanting to, to raise taxes. What you'll see is people protesting about those taxes. Because I think young people and, and this new emerging group has found a new democratic space to express itself. Thank you. Um, le, um, Alberto told me he has to leave a, at a quarter to five. So let me give him the word and then come back to Jeff and then we'll have an interaction uh, here. Well. Just thank you. I, I would like to face this panel from the business perspective, which is probably uh, the other stakeholder which is, which in, which is um, acting in community and talking about transparency, democracy, and things like that. Uh, another thing that is from this business perspective, I would like to, to point out one idea which I think is, is, is clear um, in this kind of, of debate, which is the new role of companies within the new society for the new world, in the new era, and the new, and the new future. Yeah, I think that this, this role is slightly different than the, the role that we thought probably 15 years ago. 15 years ago, Michael Porter defined everything, and every company was uh, working with the Michael Porter schemes, with the five competitive advantages, and talking about competitors, suppliers, um, new entrants, or whatever. I think this scheme, thanks to technology, thanks to social networks, thanks to um, all the uh, technology that we have in mind, customers, regulators, or, or whatever, this uh, scheme has completely changed. Uh, and I think that this, new pr that this old paradigm is, is, a, is completely old fashioned. And in my understanding, we have to look for a new competitive framework for companies. Uh, there are some people who is talking about with another idea which is around the, the non-market strategy. This non-market strategy is, is a new position of the company that it is not only a question of how we compete with uh, our competitors, but how we, the company, has to deal with NGOs, with local governments, with global multinational institutions, with uh, global media, with um, individuals and citizens like uh, actives, uh, how the companies, how to deal with all these kind of things and understanding that we companies are living in the planet. So we have to take care of the resources, we have to take care of the demographic movements, we have to take care of this kind of things. So in this new paradigm, in this new framework, the companies are quite, quite fragile, quite, quite um, small, are not as powerful as we, were for, as we were before. Think about one thing. One institution like change.org, now it's changing uh, how the companies has to behave. Uh, just one citizen can open one debate on social network 
and can oblige you and can push you to change your strategy. And this is completely different. A micro port don't think about that <laughs> 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And now the problem is that there are no other new micro porter who is uh, defining a new uh, strategic framework for companies. This is the first thing. And the second thing from a business perspective is regarding transparency. Uh, I think transparency probably is in the key of everything. Transparency is around equality. Transparency is around sharing power. Transparency is, a, is around anti-corruption. Transparency is, a, is around ethical behavior. And uh, the real thing is that, think about transparency, is the most relevant disinfectant that uh, everybody has against corruption. And in my understanding, all these kind of things will shape into the future a new kind of company. A uh, company more social committed, not in terms of philanthropy, but in terms of their core business. A company more open, a company more ethical, a company more uh, engaged with the new global stakeholders, a company with a different system of communication, a company probably which with, will, will be one corporate citizen, which is slightly different. Uh, and this is a huge, a huge challenge. Probably we have to reinvent another Michael Porter. Probably. Ma Michael Porter himself. Michael Porter himself. Uh, Kevin, come and uh. join us, Kevin. Um, sit uh, down there. Michael Porter himself, just keep the thought, but in, in um, uh, just to keep it, quoting him, in 98, he wrote a book about the beyond the philanthropy, the beyond the social yeah. responsibility around the notion of uh, share value, the company's share value contribution. But I think the interesting point you made it, um, Philip talked about the individuals pressuring governments. You talk about one individual, you know, going after a company and changing its strategy. So again, the power of the individual and what the individual can do with their power. And, and I think Jeff can really talk about, you know, what he's been thinking on uh, and, and, and how this bringing together this, you know, massive amorphous movement to actually action, right? So, Jeff, and then we'll come back to, to Kevin. Glad you, you joined. London traffic still as bad as it always been. <laughs> Very bad. Well, um, I, I'm, it's a pleasure to be here today with, uh, hosted by both Telefonica and the United Nations uh, Development um, Agency. I apologize, I'm from Silicon Valley. So uh, I usually start a new presentation outside the U.S. by apologizing. <laughs> um, <coughs> but, you know, one of the things that we learned at Apple that was really interesting for us that I really feel is a lesson that I still think of today working with the United Nations globally and, and telecoms globally is that Apple was not relevant in the world it was in when it was doing its turnaround in 1996 and 1997. It used the entertainment industry to a great extent to change the dialogue with consumers and move away from Apple as an operating system to Apple as a platform to consume music, to consume video. In many ways, what, what Alberto was talking about uh, is equal to that with social investment. Um, I believe that from this point on in the world we live in, and the tr world my children live in, social investment with corporations will be the currency of their brand reputation that just like Apple needed to kind of live on the backs of the music industry to reinvent itself, today corporations that don't understand the authenticity and relevance that comes by connecting to the world around them, and particularly with young people, will very quickly risk irrelevance. And it's not just a short-term perspective around causes or cons corporate responsibility. It has to be deeply rooted in the culture and the countries themselves. In fact, I think we're going to see for the first time with the World Cup that who would have thought World Cup and the idea of global soccer, the beautiful game as you call it outside the United States, would actually become another face for globalization. That protests would take place in all countries. Brazil, who loves soccer collectively, um, because of the notion that the investment made in stadiums wasn't being made with the people themselves in education and healthcare and transportation. So I think from a corporate perspective, 
it has never been more important for corporations to realize that social good is, the, is good business. Yeah. And that from this point on, their reputation, their relevancy will be connected to meaningful, long-term social investment the same way Apple had to find a way to be relevant with music, today is much more around social good. And I think the World Cup this next 2014 will be a fascinating case study on what are those logos with FIFA have really invested in the countries of Latin America in meaningful, measured way, or otherwise they too will be perceived as a part of globalization. But that's the corporate perspective. There's also the young person perspective. Many years ago, I coined a term um, at Apple called screenagers. We started realizing very quickly that global youth wasn't a demographic, it was becoming a psychographic, the behavior of a world where there's always been screens, cell phones, internet access, uh, video games, um, and even now smart television sets. And what we find interesting with young people, and a little bit worrisome, candidly, is just as corporations have a new role, young people don't want to be preached to. And there's a tremendous irony that with mobile technology being a platform for social and, and creative expression, individual empowerment, that young people don't connect self-expression with voting. Probably one of the most fascinating contradictions in the United States today is that young people have given up on voting. To get particularly minorities to come to polling centers to vote, even though they're the most active mobile culture in the United States, is a tremendous irony. And so we're gonna see more and more the notion of how do you take young people and social media, and I would even argue that without shortening the distance between social media and hysteria to real world action, we actually find that the reason that social media begins a movement gets lost by the young people themselves. In other words, voting is a real action in the physical world we live in. Going to school is a real action. You know, Voting for the new millennium goals for the United Nations post-2014 uh, is a real action. So young people, too, have to be given the tools to shorten the distance between social media frenzy that can sometimes lose the reason that something became a cause and a real action. If we can ground things in the Arab Spring and in you know United States with an action from social media you know, uh, uh, movements, we actually find young people become less cynical. And we have lots of research, we've done this in 70 countries, that the more they can see the proof of their impact from what started as social media interest and almost lifts up like a, like a balloon, the more constructive they become in their society. So just like corporations have a responsibility, young people too, we need to give them the tools to not just empower them, but to sh shorten the distance between social media trends and campaigns on the big screen, which become more about like to real world action which becomes more about want and more about need. And you're gonna see a tremendous shift, even in the United States, from big screen social media and easy thumbs up, thumbs down to real world actions, voting for the new millennium goals, voting in a political campaign, actually showing up physically in a polling center. So the second responsibility is for the technology industry and telecoms to actually use the tool of personalization that mobile's become and connect that self-expression, that powering of their voice with also voting. And you will see, in the third point I wanna make, in the technology world, we can actually create the digital breadcrumbs with rewards-based systems, fair exchange of value is what we call it at Stanford in game theory, to actually give them a good reason to give us their attention from social media to actually showing up the first day they can vote at a polling center. The biggest threat to our world, in my humble opinion, because I'm not usually in Silicon Valley, isn't climate change, isn't even necessarily just the socioeconomic issues. It's that this young generation has given up on us and given up on our notion of government, and we have got to get them to connect self-expression in mobile and social media with actually voting, showing up in the real world and realizing a vote does count. And if there's a problem at a polling center, they should capture that with their phone that if we acknowledge the importance of their vote, that we give them the rewards that show the proof of their impact with mobile analytics. So th again, three points. I totally agree with, with uh, Alberto. Corporations who do not understand social investment is the core of their dialogue with the world today will not be here in 10 years. Young people will protest their corporate headquarters. 
the way my generation protested embassies. That corporations have got to understand all things equal. Brand preference with young people will be driven around sustainable, measured, proven social investment, not just what's in trend. Second is, is supporting young people to connect the mobile platform as their form of self-expression to also understanding the ultimate way to power their voice is mobile in a polling center to create a real world action and vote, to show that voting counts. Because without them voting, we have no chance to fix the problems that my generation's created with dysfunctional government. And then finally, from a technology industry perspective, we need to realize Silicon Valley got it wrong. We fell in love with the internet and big screen TV and living rooms and these silly notions of, of uh, socioeconomic gain. The small screen is not just the common denominator, it is the tool to prove with mobile analytics that someone as a corporation has had an impact and someone as a young person has shown up in the physical world, which the digital world does not replace, in the form of a vote. So young people have responsibilities, corporations have responsibilities, and the technology industry has the responsibility to use the best of mobile location-based analytics to make sure good actors get rewarded and bad actors get shown uh, as being bad actors. Thank you very much. Um, Alberto, do you, have, do you have time? Oh, I have. Yeah, okay. Kevin. Kevin. Kevin is the executive director of the, one of my favorite institutions in the world. When I used to live in London many, many moons ago, my job, my dream was to work for the Overseas Development Institute. Anybody that works in development for a long time, and I've been in this business for 20 years, cannot escape the think analytic, the potential, the beauty, you know, of the Overseas Development Institute. So he just became the executive director in June this year. Uh, what, what, what is the ODI and your own thinking about the technology and the e-governance, e-democracy, those aspects? Well, thank, uh, thanks for the question, and, uh, and also thank you for inviting me. And I have to say I'm really delighted that from today on, I'll be able to tell my children that I've played the O2 arena, <laughs> 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 even if I arrived a little late for the set. Um, and I really apologize for missing the first session from uh, Kenya, which is a country I'm particularly interested in as, as well. I mean, may, maybe I can share what I see as a couple of positives a couple of negative, uh, maybe one negative and one uh, in between. -y. So I think on the positive side, as everybody has said, there's an extraordinary potential in these technologies that I think all of us are struggling to catch up with, actually. And we continually get overtaken by events and surprised by events. And, you know, the Arab Spring was the starkest example of that. But actually, before the Arab Spring, People may remember there was a treason trial in um, Manila, in the Philippines, where a former president was found um, not guilty by a judiciary that had essentially been bribed. And within about one hour of the not guilty verdict being announced, there were 250,000 people in the square um, outside the courthouse. And the decision was eventually reversed. There was a retrial. And, and you know, and it's, it, it really is an extraordinary demonstration of the ability to link these technologies to political mobilization that can change countries. And, you know, you see it, that that's a sort of dramatic national level example. There are other examples from Kenya and India where these technologies are being used to transfer resources and money to people who have always been outside the formal banking system, outside the political system. And, you, you know, I mean, technologically, this is kid stuff, but it's transformative. For the, for the people involved. And so I, you know, I think in many of these areas, there's a potential here politically that you know, so far we haven't um, fully realized. One of the things, you, you mentioned the Millennium Development Goals. Now, you know, one of the things I'm really struck by with the Millennium Development Goals, I used to work for the UN, and I love the UN dearly. But if you give the UN an opportunity to set up a new industry, it'll set up a new industry. And we have a whole industry in monitoring the human development goals. The World Bank is doing it, the UN is doing it, governments around the world are doing it, Africa Development Bank is doing it. And they're mostly doing it through these clunking great surveys, you know, where you go and talk to 250,000 people, you knock on their doors, you fill in questionnaires, 
you bring the survey out after you've cleaned all the data two years later, by which time the world has moved on and it's not really relevant anymore. And then you find out the survey maybe wasn't done in exactly the right way. Now, you know, with these technologies, we can capture real-time information. You know, we don't have to wait for two years to find out our health systems becoming more unequal, our children in one part of a country becoming less nourished relative to another part of the country. You know, we can use apps to collect this data, to process the data, and we don't have to wait for the big bureaucracies to clunk into action, you know, with the millions of dollars that they're spending on this, um, on this industry. So, you know, I'd, we talk about the data revolution with monitoring the Millennium Development Goals, and I think, you know, we need to make that revolution happen. Um, uh, may, maybe on a couple of the less positives, if I may, and I, I suspect I'm the person on this panel that is uh, the least familiar with some of the technologies that we're talking about. But as an outsider, I'm sometimes struck by a sort of assumption that the tool or the technology is the revolutionary thing, and it's not. It's just a piece of technology. There's nothing revolutionary or progressive about it at all. You know, you can use it for good, you can use it for bad, you can use it for indifferent outcomes. But, I'm, you know, I'm very much struck by this idea, and you see it in education a lot. You know, let's take some of these technologies, go to Wajia in Kenya or South Sudan, put a fancy learning device in a classroom, and this is going to revolutionize learning. It's not going to revolutionize learning. You know, you need teachers who know how to teach literacy and numeracy to revolutionize learning. You need, you need governments who are allocating resources fairly to revolutionize learning. But I do feel that the industry often decouples technology from the political conditions under which that technology can be used for progressive outcomes. So, you know, if we talk about the technology without talking about what is it that is driving kids out of school and into labor markets, without talking about why the government of Kenya is spending three times as much on children in one part of the country that it's spending in another part of the country. You know, no amount of technology can close those gaps. So I think you know, we have to link the technology to progressive politics, um, if you like. And the, the last um, cautionary note I, I would add is, is this one. Um, I, I was very impressed recently. I'd read um, a piece by George Packer in The uh, New Yorker on technology. And he was given an example of um, a movement in, the Silicon Valley, in Silicon Valley, and I can't remember what the movement's called, but it was basically a group of app developers um, who, was, who had decided that what they wanted to do was to revolutionize transport in California. And they developed this app, which you guys have probably got, which essentially enables someone who's driving into town to signal to someone who wants a ride into town that they're going to be at a certain place at a certain time. And this you know, enables people to get together. And George Packer made the very simple point, was you know, this is great if you've got the technology and you've got a car, but what about a bit of advocacy for a decent public transport system so that poor people can get into town? And he was you know, sort of making the point that the advocacy around that app wasn't really being used to develop the public interest in a way, it was being used to enhance the selfish interest you know, of individuals in, in, the, in the industry. And I think that has to be a worry. And, the, the, and this is the very last point I'll, I'll make. Um, before I started this job in the Overseas Development Institute, I was writing a report for Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General, on extractive industries in Africa. Now, um, extractive industry is at the other end of the um, <laughs> political spectrum here. But what these guys are very good at in extractive industries, apart from getting cobalt and copper out of the ground, is tax evasion. And tax evasion costs Africa an awful lot more than goes into Africa through, over through overseas aid. And if you really wanted to make countries more self-reliant, you would tackle tax evasion. And I have to say, the IT sector and some of the companies that we're talking about here don't have a great track record on this. You know, they are masters of tax evasion in this country, across Europe, and in the United States. And so I think, you know, if, if as you say, these companies are to cut a progressive image and to project the right political values, 
to young people and to society in general. They need to cut out the tax evasion and recognize that you know, all of us depend on public, publicly financed goods and services and to shoulder their burden of responsibility. And I think you know, this comes back to the main point that we shouldn't lose sight of progressive politics in this. You know, the technologies has a key role to play, but so does politics. Thank you. Um, as I told you, it would be a fascinating panel. So um, we've got some microphones walking around there. So if anybody wants to raise a question to anybody here, please feel free and raise your hand and I'll direct the microphones to you right here on the first row. And uh, if anybody has a second question after that, uh, any other questions over the mic? Right here. Well, he can hand it over to you. Right, go ahead. Okay, thank quick, you. Uh, quick questions, if you allow. Absolutely. Uh, a quick question for, for Philip. There has been um, um, a new initiative called Internet.org, which has got quite some publicity um, here in Europe and the US with Facebook, Ericsson, and, and other companies trying to connect everyone to, to the Internet. Is that something that you see as important as it feels here? What is your opinion? Uh, so, before, let's have another question here. We'll, we'll take one more, and then we'll do another one around. Go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. I wonder uh, if uh, uh, this particular uh, institution invests in any type of technology for the purpose of democracy, and if yes, uh, where can one submit his proposals for uh, such any uh, applications if you have one? Thank you. One more question before we get a, a round of answers. All right, oh, over there. Um, what do you think of a fully decentralized democracy? As in democracy with voting online, but no central server, just complete peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer communication using distributed hash tables and friend-to-friend -friend networks? Right, Philip, answer your question, we'll take the other two. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's not a difficult question because I'm, I'm looking at context. And the thing about technology is, is context is key. Africa, and I look at Africa. Remember, we have 54 states. In the 54 states, only four or five countries have actually an access to information law. So even for Kenya itself, even though we are leading in open data, we don't even have an access to information freedom for information law. And that actually defines how people access. So whether or not you have an initiative like that, there are physical barriers that, that actually have to be addressed. And a real political will that actually ensures that whether or not internet or Facebook.org exists or this or that exists, that people can actually be able to use the internet without fear. Because for us, the, that is what I see as a threat to, to democracy in our case. You may have internet from Nairobi up to Lokichogyo, but as long as, and for us, we work on simple issues as service delivery. And our research is showing that when people even report physically on issues of service delivery, some of them are even arrested or put in jail. So if, if those physical world threats still exist, then the internet even makes, makes you more susceptible, more accessible. Even groups that were, and think about it, a lot of these people who are, who are getting online are those who previously did not have opportunity for expression. So think of them as, 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 as the bottom of the pyramid. And so if you begin to expose them into this new terrain, that they become visible and become vocal, then you're also increasing their level of threats if there's no safety net or catches. So I think for me, it has to go both ways. And even though companies will create the infrastructure, because innovators will leverage on company infrastructure, there still has to be some physical or, or, or legal protection that actually protects me. I, I always see it as an individual. And that individual I see as an individual without power, uh, as much as he may be able to access uh, internet or technology. On, on your question about, I'm assuming you were asking the United Nations, right, in terms of, I'll give you my card, we'll talk. Uh, you know, we don't have a formal mechanism, but we can, uh, if you have something interesting, we would love to see. Um, does anybody want to tackle that question on, of the peer-to-peer, -peer full democracy, no central server, yeah, yeah. you know? So I'll just say, uh, I went to elementary school in Africa, which probably helped transform me as a not typical Silicon Valley person. And I'm sure you've read, there's a lot of theories right now, Google's looking at doing, um, 
a solution or campaign where they literally have what used to be like weather balloons um, actually staying in position or being able to move with the weather to provide high speed access uh, to the entire continent of Africa. Um, you might wonder, is that pie in the sky or is that Google just trying to do something Apple can't do? It's a little bit of both, candidly. Um, the interesting thing is we're seeing, what I love about mobile um, and small screen is we're seeing the true example of reverse innovation. The best solutions from the world, I think, moving forward will not be coming from Silicon Valley, will not be coming from the Western world. They will be coming from largely Africa. I'm seeing the best healthcare apps come out of Nigeria. I'm seeing unbelievable innovative solutions around education. I actually even think in partnership with the United Nations, we're going to find refugee camps become some of the most sophisticated mobile communities just because you can enhance the cell signal quickly and use disposable phones where minutes are subsidized to start doing rationing, trading of services, you know, just simple human um, uh, hierarchy of needs. But in the case of democracy, I think the challenge of a true plebiscite through mobile, which is something that I think philosophically I personally love, and I believe in fair exchange of value and every interaction on a cell phone, the challenge is obviously integrity and, and accuracy, right? And I think that showing up in the physical world to vote, even in a world where I, I do an absentee ballot, is still going to be a critical element of connecting back the integrity of a vote with somebody who started from registering to vote perhaps through the phone. And I think you'll see in one case in the US, registration will become more mobile based, but voting will become even more about checking into a polling center a thousand feet within a polling booth, not knowing who you voted for, not knowing even if you voted, but pr predicting that you probably did if you're within a thousand feet of a polling center. And I think because of how easy it is to hack and you know, to, I've seen mobily un, you know, huge ability to, 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 to break uh, through code, I think showing up for a while longer will be very important. I think the next phase of mobile is using mobile to get people to be able to be registered and then showing up to, to vote. Once we can get more secure, um, the notion of a plebiscite for political campaigns may become more real. But I think issue advocacy will be through mobile and will be a plebiscite. And I think that will be worldwide and I think it will be rooted in the um, developing world. Kevin, you want to add something on this before we close up? Well, um, may, I mean, may, maybe just two very brief observations. You know, I, I was very struck by uh, a lot of people will remember when Malala, the Pakistani schoolgirl, was um, mm -hmm. shot. It was a you know, terrible event. Yesterday. But since then, there's been a huge mobilization among school children for a campaign that Malala is supporting, which is very much driven by you know, these types of technologies. Um, and I was actually in the United Nations uh, last, uh, well, a few months ago when Malala was there and basically took over the building with a group of 600-odd school yeah. children who had actually been brought together through these type of networks. And I think yeah, that's a fantastic example of a very vulnerable community using these technologies to empower themselves and to deliver change. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't agree more on this refugee point. Um, two weeks ago, I was in the Bakar Valley in Lebanon talking to Syrian refugees. And many of them have arrived with injuries, um, you know, not in all cases serious injuries, but you know, needing treatment, who are unable to get treatment because it takes so long to register. And the registration processes are extraordinary, actually. Yeah. You know, it's like being in London in 1950. You, know, you fill out three forms, it can take up to a month. You have to go to an office, which is two hours away. It costs you a lot of money to get there. And I, for the life of me, can't see why we can't adapt these technologies to these fast-changing contexts. You know, the big bureaucracies aren't always that, that efficient at responding to. All right, so we have to wrap it up. You know, I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank the audience. You know, and, um, you know, as, as, a, as a parting thought, we have to make sure that as our generations protest in front of embassies <laughs> and in front of the papers, and then, you know, we got a little bit of a, a change, but then became cynical. So how does this generation, who is more individually in power than any generation in history does not become cynical because the dialogue in the virtual world is fantastic, but the real world doesn't change. So we gotta make sure that this connection is made to avoid cynicism to this current generation. Thank you very much, have a good day. <laughs>